Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue the series I began last week on breast cancer. Breast cancer, unfortunately, is a very common problem. Breast cancer represents roughly 30% of all cancers in women. It's very, it's very common. One out of every eight women in this country and around the world, uh, in fact, uh, are at the risk of developing breast cancer. According to the American Cancer Society, uh, 255,180, let me see, uh, uh, individual in this year is, is expected to have breast cancer, both men and women. Uh, of that number, uh, 460 men will die of breast cancer, and then uh, 4,610 women will die of breast cancer. Very, very, very common problem. When I left off last week, I pretty much was giving an overview of how we go about evaluating someone for breast cancer, the importance of taking the history, the importance of knowing the family history, the importance of the patient's age, and the American Society and the GYN Society and the other powers to be now agrees uh, from the age of 40 a woman should have breast cancer every year, every two years thereabout. They finally agree with that after years of arguing about it. Now, again, that has to be taken in context. It has to be taken in context because if a woman has family history of breast cancer, such so the mother had breast cancer, the sister had breast cancer, the maternal aunt had breast cancer, or the father had <coughs> prostate cancer or colon cancer, or the sister had ovarian cancer, etc., you have to be begin to evaluate this particular woman in her early 30s. That, that's just the way it is. And <clears throat> because it, 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 it is in context. Also, you have subgroup of individuals, such as in the, in, in the black females, you have a subgroup of black females who are between the ages of 40 and 45 who have a tendency of having a particular types of breast cancer called uh, estrogen negative. Uh, progesterone negative type breast cancer, which is very aggressive, very difficult to treat, and these individuals tend to be obese as well. Those subgroup of individuals, you really have got to pay attention to them at an earlier age and more frequently. So <coughs> once you go about that, then you decide that the individual has to uh, uh, be paid close attention to. We, by that I mean the patient, she has to be instructed to monthly to evaluate her breast herself in front of a mirror when she's having her period, a few days before that or a few days after, she has to do that. Why the mirror? The mirror is very important because sometimes the first indicator that there may be a breast cancer uh, in a woman's breast it could be a retraction in the breast. A retraction is seen best when you're looking at the, at the mirror, so on and so forth. And of course, any pain in the breast, any discomfort in the breast, and the nipple thereabout, that has to be brought to the attention of a physician. If the woman is not breastfeeding and she sees a, a milky discharge coming out of the nipple, that is an abnormality. It could be due to an endocrine problem, but it could also be associated with breast cancer, etc. So you gotta be very careful with that. Now, <clears throat> once you do that, then you take a history and the patient, has to be uh, uh, examined. Uh, the breast has a specific ways, very, believe it or not, a specific ways of examining a breast so that you don't miss anything. Uh, you got to do it in four quadrant so that nothing is missed. And you also have to do go under the arm to palpate under the arm to make sure there is nothing there. You have to also palpate around here, over the axilla, to, right, right over there to make sure there is uh, right here right here to examine to make sure there's no node because sometimes the first indicator that there may be something wrong with the breast, you may be palpating in nodes over here or sometimes you palpate in nodes under the axilla. So those things, you either have to know them or you don't know them. So the doctors who are most frequently are, are associated with examining a patient breast are OBGYN, uh, breast surgeon, uh, general internist, uh, family doctors, etc. And it is done in a particular way. We, we teach students and intern and resident how to do it so that you really don't miss anything. All right, so that's, that's, that goes without saying. 
after you've done that, then of course you proceed to do a mammogram. That's the first step. You do usually in my practice, I do the mammogram and the sonogram at the same time because I almost always, if the radiologist see a cystic lesion or a lesion, they want to repeat it by doing mammogram by doing a sonogram. So I order both at the same time. That gives the radiologist the opportunity to do one if she sees he or he sees something uh, that is of a suspicious nature. Uh, and in particular, if the woman is a younger woman, the breast is very dense, and the sonogram is very important to be able to pick up uh, lesion that way. So those are the first two steps. Other tests that are available, of course, digital mammography, and of course, MRI. MRI comes into play in women that are mostly of high risk, namely the, the, the mother has bre had breast cancer or has breast cancer. Uh, the sister had or has breast cancer, and you know the chances of her developing can breast cancer is very high, and this is a very young, the woman is younger, the breast is very dense, so you go right for an MRI. So you bypass the mammogram, you bypass the sonogram, you might bypass, you go, you go right for, a for an MRI. So every year, you follow this particular lady by doing an MRI. The MRI is more sensitive, costs more money, but it's much more sensitive than the mammogram, the sonogram, etc. So that's how we go about it. Okay. Now, let's get to to the point now that something is found in the breast. The question is, what is that something? Okay. First, you would obviously talk to the uh, to the lady involved. Sometime at the radiology department itself, the radiologists who are involved in doing mammograms and reading mammograms have a special uh, experience and uh, ability to actually do a biopsy using on their sonographic guidance. They're trained to it, they're good at it, they can do that. That's one way of doing it. So they can do it right there. Either the patient's told to come back, uh, to get it done, or if it's agreeable, they can do it the same day that they see it, that they see it, etc. It's a core biopsy on the sonographic uh, guidance. That's one way. The next way is that something is found, whatever that something happened to be a mass, it looks cystic, it does not, whatever, then you will refer the patient to a breast surgeon. There are surgeons who do absolutely nothing else but surgery on the breast. That is all they do and they are outstanding, they, that is all they do. They have so many to do that, that keeps them busy. So you refer them to a breast surgeon. The breast surgeon then, I, I prefer frankly the breast surgeon because what it is is that when you refer them to the breast surgeon, he or she is going to do a complete reevaluation of the situation and then decide if the biopsy is indeed necessary or not. And at that point, I just transfer the patient's breast care to the breast surgeon, and he or she will decide what to do from here forward as it relates to the management of the issue of the breast until they push it to the biopsy. Now, if unfortunately the biopsy turns out to be positive, then it, it, the, the patient is already in the hands of the same surgeon that's going to do the procedure. So this way, that's done that way. That's what I do. I, 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 I work also with the radiologist. So I have no problem. Sometimes they do it. And then uh, if the woman agrees to let him do it, they go right ahead and do it, and they do a good job. But if I'm the one that's making the decision, almost always I refer the lady to a breast surgeon. And then if the breast surgeon decides to just observe the patient, he or she is doing that every six months, every three months, every year, or whatever. That's the way I do it now. <clears throat> so this is how we go about doing the evaluation of the breast. If, unfortunately, the biopsy is carried out, it turns out to be, in fact, positive for breast cancer. Now, that's a different story altogether. Then the decision has to be made between the patient, patient's family, what's best, and the surgeon recommendation, what's best, what is the best procedure to do? Okay, what are the procedures that are out there? Well, first of all, you do the biopsy, okay? The biopsy is done, the tissue is out, and it gets sent to the pathology lab. Now, here comes the thing. I'm gonna discuss with you what it is that 
medical oncologists such as myself would like to ask the pathologist to do on the tissue. Okay, we need to know the characteristics of this cancer if it is turns out to be cancer. What am I talking about? Well, <clears throat> we need to know if it is, we have to do estrogen positive or estrogen negative, progesterone negative or positive, or HER2 positive or negative. HER2, I brought this to show you what the HER2, which is a very important thing. HER2 is to stand for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor 2. That's what the HER2, H-E-R-2 stand for, okay? Uh, that's a crucial thing. Now, HER2 positivity can be found on other cancer besides breast. But the, the HER2 positivity is absolutely crucial, okay? Now, if the tissue comes back estrogen positive, progesterone positive, the approach to the management of patient we go one way. If it comes back to estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HER2 positive, we handle it one way. N non surgically, that is. Surgically speaking, after this, this tissue is characterized, then of course the surgeon will proceed to do one or two procedures. They will do either a lumpectomy based on the uh, desire of the patient, what the patient wants done, or they will do, when they do the lumpectomy, they're going to do also dissection of node. I'm not a surgeon, I disqualify myself, but they have ways at the time of the lumpectomy to do a dissection of nodes under the arm, they to, and then they sample, they took out so many nodes and see which one, if any, is positive for cancer. That's very important. That's all I'm gonna say about it. Not a surgeon, never been in the OR when the breast surgery is done. I don't have a clue. I know all the other stuff, but not the surgical aspect, but that's what they're gonna do. If on the other one, based on the characteristic of the biopsy, how invasive the, the tumor was locally, then the recommendation is gonna be made how big the tumor was as well. That's very important, how big the mass was, whether a, a mastectomy is the way to go versus lumpectomy. If it was a big mass, it was really penetrated in the muscle, then you know, it makes sense that you're gonna to have to do a mastectomy. And then the mastectomy then has to be done with the choice of the lady that uh, she wants breast reconstruction done at the same time, okay? If it is being done at the same time, at the time of the mastectomy, a plastic surgeon who does that kind of work is, comes to participate in the procedure and they begin the process of the reconstruction at the, for the first step of it at the same time, and that, and then we take it from there. <clears throat> so that is pretty much the, the um, <clears throat> what the surgeons would do. If it, uh, the, um, once that's done, the breast is taken out, then we're talking about staging. That's a different step altogether. We are talking about staging. Breast cancer is stage one through four. That has to do with how penetrating the tumor was, how many nodes are positive or not, and so on, and that gives you the staging. The, and then the staging of the cancer, meaning how advanced it is or is not, the characteristics of the tissue, namely HER2 positive, estrogen positive, progesterone positive or negative, that then give us the whole picture how we can tell the patient what the prognosis is. That's what we put together to tell us what the prognosis is going to be. Because breast cancers that are estrogen negative, progesterone negative, are handled completely differently. And the reason why that is, as I mentioned last week, I began to talk a little bit about it. You have to understand that estrogen plays an outstandingly major role in the whole concept of breast cancer. 
it is the key hormone that stimulates the breast, that allows the cancer to grow more and not grow more. You understand that? That's why estrogen is so, is so important. As I mentioned last week, and I will explain it in more detail, if a young girl begins to have her menstrual period between the ages of eight or nine, or in, in that range, that means that her breast tissue has had longer time to be exposed to the effect of estrogen, making it her more likely to develop breast cancer. It may not quite frequently, but I just explained that to you. If a woman never was pregnant, never carry a fetus to term in her entire life, she's childless. That means she's never had a chance to give her breast tissue a break from the effect of estrogen. Okay, because when a woman have children, for a period of time, the level of estrogen will drop, then the tissue get a chance to rest from the effect of estrogen. So that's why I talk about the risk factors, not only the genetics, not only all these other stuff that I'm talking about, but the exposure to estrogen is very important. Also, before we talk about prognosis, we also have to mention about BACA1 and BACA2. So there's a whole section in the hospital that deal with genetics evaluation to see if the patient is BACA1, BACA2, because then that brings in the whole ovarian, ovary situation. Because if the woman is BACA positive, her chances of developing ovarian cancer is quite high. But there's a whole section in the hospital that deal with that. So the patient has to deal with that. So then we put all that in co into context when the surgeon is going to proceed to do his or her thing. And then when we get all this information back, estrogen positivity, negativity, estrogen progesterone positive or negative, HER2 negative or positive, BACA1, BACA2 negative or positive, all this come in the package that allow us to make a, an evaluation of the prognosis of this, of this patient, okay? And that is crucial. That is absolutely crucial because that also determines how the treatment is proceed forward from, from this point on. Okay, because you have to understand something. In my view, as someone who is a cancer survivor, I can tell you for a fact, and I survived three separate cancer at three separate times. Cancer is a systemic disease. Let me, let me repeat that. Cancer is a systemic disease. Don't let anybody fool you. This is why it is crucial to pick up cancer at the earliest possible time. If I did not pick my cancers that I had three separate times early enough, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Each time that I felt that I had cancer, I had to diagnose myself. Because when I seek help, I was told I didn't have cancer. But I knew I did. But being a physician and being a cancer specialist, I know what to look for. And I did. And sure enough, each separate time, I diagnosed myself. And here I am, years later, I'm here talking to you about cancer. So I know what I'm talking about. Not only am I talking about as a physician and a medical educator, but I'm a cancer survivor. And if I did not participate, actively participate in the evaluation and diagnosis and treatment of my own cancers, I wouldn't have a chance, okay? Okay, now, now that you've done that, then the next thing is what you're gonna do. Well, you're talking about a whole bunch of twists and turn. Now that you've done that, the tissue is back. Now you gotta do an evaluation. You will get to get your blood count done, your blood chemistry profile. You will get your, 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 your CAT scan done. And depending on what the pathology result shows, you may wind up getting a PET scan done. Because the PET scan will tell you, I just mentioned that cancer being systemic, the PET scan will tell you 
if the cancer had in fact spread, and if it spread, how much has it spread and where it has spread. The CAT scan gives you some information, but it's limited information. The PET scan is not limited. Let me tell you what the PET, the PET scan is and what does it do. PET scan is a procedure whereby, first of all, you have to understand something. All cancer require protein, sugar to grow, sugar, yeah. It sucks protein from us, we know that, but it also requires sugar to grow. That being the case, the powers to be, using the brilliance years ago, decided to create a procedure whereby they will tag a nuclear substance with a molecule of, of glucose in particular, and then they will then inject that in and if into a vein, into a patient whom they're evaluating for spread of cancer, knowing very well that wherever there's cancer cells in the body that is growing, the cancer cell is gonna pick up the sugar that is attached in that nu nuclear tracer. That's right. So therefore, they will inject that into, into a vein and let the patient lie there very quietly, and you cannot have had sugar intravenously for 12 hours before that. So we know we know that. So we prepare the patient, and then after a few hours, then they'll scan the patient. Because why they scan? They scan it because the nuclear tracer, they'll, they'll be able to scan looking for that. And it will show up. It will light up. Wherever there is cancer, it will light up. Sometimes if there is a bad inflammation or a chronic infection, but Believe me, the nuclear radiologists are smart people. They're able to discern which is cancer, and which is not cancer. All right? So this is how the PET scan is done. The insurance companies will fight you, fight you to the death to prevent you from getting it done because it is expensive. Believe me, it is expensive. And un unfortunately, as it turns out, if it is done inside a hospital while the patient is admitted, they won't pay for it. No, believe me, you can't make this. Now you hear all these incredible things that's going on with the healthcare bill and the Senate, etc. If you do a PET scan on a patient that is admitted inside a hospital, hospital will not get paid, and the patient wind up having to pay thousands of dollars. And uh, you understand that? And now you wind up having to twist and turn to find a way to get the patient on the outside to do a PET scan. Well, if the patient is very sick, how are you going to do that? You can't discharge the patient just so that you can get a PET scan done. That's, that doesn't make any medical sense, ethically or professionally. doesn't make any sense. So you wind up having to do a CAT scan, or you wind up having to do bone scan, which is fine, but not as sensitive. Now, yeah, I could do bone scan. The cancer goes into the bone. We have the radiologist can tell you that, but it's an old-fashioned test. It's being done all over the world, but the PET scan is several times more sensitive, more modern, more better. But if it's done inside a hospital, hospital will not get paid. And this is an expensive test. They will not get paid for nuclear substance that is used to do the test, and they will not pay, period. So you gotta do it as an outpatient. Then the fight began. It's an all-out war. Believe me, every day. I see patients in my office two days a week. The other three days I spend fighting with insurance companies for medi over, medi over medication and fighting over getting tests done. And it's an all out fight. Talking about an hour and a half each time, sometimes two hours on the telephone, being shifted around, the phone being hung up on you because they don't want to have to pay. And it is an all out war and, 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 and it's very rare that you got to fight to get to talk to a doctor. T doctor to doctor talk, which is uh, demanded by law, it's, it's, it's not something that happened that often. You got to fight and demand it to make sure that you could speak to your colleagues, in particular somebody who's also a medical oncologist who would understand what it is that I'm talking about. You got to fight to get that done, okay? So uh, it's, it, it, especially older folks who have had uh, Medicare and if they're hooked up with the Part D thing, uh, there's no doctors available to talk to you about a medication that you want. 
That's right. That system does not allow a doctor, and you got to fight to get through <laughs> through a, a pharmacist uh, to try to explain clinical medicine. Can you imagine? I mean, these are brilliant people, but give me a break. So that's what's going on. So in the meantime, you have a patient's life in your hand, question to be answered, and you can't give proper answer if you don't have the proper result. So this is how difficult the process is. And you have people who have nothing to do with medicine, making all this incredible political decision to score political points, while people's lives are at risk. Okay, how are you going to get all these older folks who work all their lives, contributed to the economy, who are now in nursing home? You can't understand how expensive nursing home is. You can't be a nursing home if you don't have Medicaid. You have to be a multimillionaire to be able to pay the bill. So most people that are in nursing home, they wind up having to be Medicaid. And now they want to cut the money off of Medicaid and they're giving all kind of crazy answers. They don't understand what, they've never been inside a nursing home They can cure the patient in their lives and then they know everything. The truth is they don't know anything. They just want to score a political point. So breast cancer is a serious problem, major problem. A lot of women, one out of eight women in this country is at risk to develop breast cancer. And men also develop breast cancer and the breast cancer in men, for whatever reason, is a very aggressive disease. And like I said earlier, I think this year, look at, what is it, 460 or something like that? Yeah, uh, 460, that's right, 460 men will die of breast cancer. So it's a serious problem. It's a serious problem. So in any event, uh, we had plenty of times left yet to talk about breast cancer. And then next, uh, next time I'll begin to talk about treatment involving chemotherapy, radiotherapy, etc. Until such time, keep watching the show. This is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.